Tonight, On Her Shoulders has for you medieval mothers of drama. Uh, my name is Melissa Atterbury. I'm one of the co-producers of On Her Shoulders. And um, this is a co-production of New Perspective Theatre Company, where you are right now, and also the um, New School for Drama. And so a lot of the actors you're going to see tonight um, are graduates of uh, one of the programs there. Uh, you're going to see a couple of like, short pieces. And Melody Brooks, who is also the other co-producer of On Her Shoulders and also the artistic director of uh, New, per New Perspectives Theatre Company, uh, is going to give you, um, she's going to put the play in context for you, each, each play. So she'll give us a little history lesson, tell us what's significant about the play, and we'll see the play and then she'll do that for the next. And then words, um, and Melody Brooks. So good evening again. I'm going to echo uh, Melissa's thank you for being here. This is really an exciting evening for us. Um, way more exciting than I ever thought it was going to be when we made the decision to do these two uh, women tonight. And I'm going to ask for your indulgence, because I have a lot to say, which will surprise no one. Um, and take us back a little bit into not just the history of these two women, but why we're doing this in the first place and why it matters. Um, not just to the history of women in theater, but the history of women's central, significant role in the entire development of Western history. And as I like to say, it's time for a paradigm shift in the way in which we think about Western history. So with that modest uh, goal in mind, um, let me just say that we, I'm a member of the League of Professional Theater Women, and then there's some fellow League members here, and the League does give some support to this program. Back in 2009, uh, we had an event called 5050 in 2020, which was gathering women to argue for parity for women theater artists, mostly playwrights and directors. Because the number of plays produced in commercial theaters and the regional theaters has hovered around 20% for most of the 20th century. And uh, you know that this is the centennial year of women getting the right to vote in the nation. <clears throat> Uh, so the idea that we could we could reach towards parity. And out of that came a bunch of little small initiatives and ideas about practical ways in which we could achieve that goal. Um, and one of the things was that we have to really tell the story of the history of women in theater. And the woman who initially started on the shoulder, Susan Jonas, had authored, I think, the last study that was done in 2003 about the numbers of women in theater. Um, and she came up with the idea, when many of us have been talking about this, because it's not taught in theater history textbooks, it's not taught in Western civilization courses, um, of really trying to bring some of these plays forward and put them in a reading format so we could get modern directors and producers interested in doing them again and taking another look. So New Perspectives came on board as a co-producer of On Her Shoulders in the summer of 2013, and then it was a very hard thing to do to constantly come up with plays and go through the process. So we took over, the, the original producers dropped out and we kept it going, took over in November of 2013. We also did far fewer a year, we do quarterly. Because just to do the research and try to gather the information and take it seriously, also working with the new school, there's scheduling issues, which is why we're here tonight instead of at the new school, for those of you who are regulars. Um, and so far we have done 45, women, playwrights, uh, 45 plays, 37 playwrights, ranging from the, uh, a, the years now, around 965 to 1970. 1970 is our cutoff date. So, a little theater history. When I was in college 100 years ago, um, we thought that women started writing plays that Lillian Hellman was the first one we'd done. <laughs> <laughs> Another, you know, a generation later, uh, people talk about Afro Bed. How many of you have heard of Afro Bed? Yeah, so most of you. So she's now pretty well, but also she's put out there as like the only woman who was writing plays in the 17th century. There were quite a number of them, and there was a project um, that came out of that 2003 report, the Professional Women Playwrights, that did work about 10 of the women who were writing in the 17th, when I think into the 18th centuries. Um, but even so, somebody, if you go online, you'll get a lot of these women, but it's not a regular thing. So after the 10 plays that um, Susan Jonas had picked for that first year, and we started doing our own research, because New Perspectives' mission is to be 
diverse and inclusive that we wanted to try to figure out how do we get women who are not just you know uh, middle class, upper class English women or even French women occasionally um, and get a, get a broader perspective so we started looking and it was amazing what we found um, and always in the back of our mind was Roswitha and Roswitha or Rosavita uh, Wikipedia says the actual pronunciation is Rosweet um, is on the radar for scholars, some theater history people, uh, but she was writing in the end of the 10th century. So our tagline for On Her Shoulders, women have been writing plays for a thousand years, is because of her. And so we decided that we would, uh, we have a young woman, Cindy Martinez, who's in the back, who's our intern, and we were talking about this program and we just decided for Sydney here that we might as well start at the beginning. Um, and we decided to do these two women. As we've done On Her Shoulders for the last five years now, each time we come up with a playwright that isn't supposed to have been there, and we have our conversations afterwards, what we hear is, why didn't I know this? I'm so angry. How come no one told me? Or, well, but, there can't be any more. Right. We heard that after we did uh, Mercy Otis Warren. 1775, American playwright. Huge patriot, amazing writer, amazing woman. There's a statue of her in Massachusetts. Lots of people know her as a revolutionary mother. She wrote the first history of the American Revolution by a woman. So people sort of know she exists. Uh, but that was the first time we heard the, well, there can't be any more American playwrights who were running at the time. And so I will say to you about Rose Vita, Rose Sweet, uh, that she's the one we think, you know, that she gets credit for being the earliest known, but it is impossible to believe that there was nobody before her. She's also credited as being the first female Western poet since Sappho, who was writing in like 500 BC. So if we want to look at that 1500 year period and say, really, there were no female Western poets in that time period? I don't think so. And one of the things that I, as I did this research that was really exciting, you know, I'm the kind of person that like reads history for fun, and I know not a lot of people are, uh, but putting together strands of things, and I think that that's also something that this program is doing, is that it's not just, oh, here's a list of female playwrights, oh, here's some plays you can look at, but what it means, what's the connectivity here? Because one of the things that really excited me was that Rosewood was a Saxon. This was in Saxony. And if you know your history, history of Charlemagne, you know, um, Rome fell, he rose out of the ashes, 600, 700, created this empire, was proclaimed the Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, he was really big on education. He, it's doubtful whether he could read or write. He was literate in some ways, but we don't really know how literate he was. But he really pushed it and established monastic schools all over the place. So we think monastic school, we think a bunch of guys, right? Monks. No, there was tons of schools for women, and they were monastic, they were located in abbeys, often attached to a, a male monastery, but not always. And um, he also was pushing uh, Christianity, right? Trying to force pagan cultures to convert. So it took him over 30 years to subdue the Saxons in Saxony. Um, and even then it was brutal and bloody. It was not done by the acquiescence of the people, it was done by sheer brute force. And when uh, Gandersheim, the abbey that Rosvita was at, was founded in 850, that was only 50 years since the Saxons had been thoroughly crushed. And I would like to think that, you know, the Saxon and the Celtic cultures, women had much higher status, they had a lot more freedom, they could be rulers, they could own property. So this was what was being crushed, and then these collections of women, mostly noble women, gathered in these abbeys and had the finest education one could have at the time, and probably even now, um, that there was some idea, it wasn't odd to them that women should be doing this, or that women should be leaders, or that women should um, be doing anything. If you look in the play, but we have a little essay, that the abbess of Gandersheim, who was a princess, she had her own army, her own mint, she had a seat in the imperial diet of the Roman Empire. So do we think of women in the 10th century having this amount of power? 
And I say if there's one, there's probably several. Uh, and the, the reforms that Charlemagne was pushing in his successors, I think are really evident in rules for this work. One was the um, making Christianity, a, a, looking for a deeper spiritual life. And the other was really eradicating paganism. Because in 50 years, you don't lose your pagan beliefs. We haven't lost them in 2,000 years in some cultures, if you really dig beneath the, the Christian holidays and that sort of thing. Um, and so we see in Rose with this writing that she really is talking about a deeper spiritual life. But she's also, um, I think, referencing some of her pagan roots. So she's, she's talking about, you know, she's giving us saints' lives and uh, the play that you're going to see tonight, which is the first sort of miracle play that we know of. Um, I'm going to make that always be what that we know of. Uh, when everything we say about this one. And uh, that her plays are about fights with the devil. That was one of the agreements that the Saxon king uh, agreed to when he, they were finally crushed was that not only would they become Christian, but they had to give up their, what they called, what the Christians called their pagan devil. So the devil figures very prominently in her writing, and it will be very prominently figured in the piece you see tonight. Um, also, the education and being able to go into these abbeys was mostly available to noble women, certainly the education was. But they were not nuns in the sense that they had to not do anything with the rest of the world. As a canoness, Rosutha, and there were many of them, again, there were, there were other abbeys, um, they got to keep all their money and all their luxury goods. They got to keep their servants. They got an education that, you know, was a, the, all the classical texts. Uh, there's more details in the, in the play, though, but... Um, and that made me think about another connection. That we did a play called The Convent of Pleasure, written mm -hmm. by Margaret, Margaret Cavendish. And she wrote that in 1668. She was an English countess. She was called Mad Madge. Um, considered to be one of the first science fiction writers. But her play, The Convent of Pleasure, is about a group of women who enter a convent, but it's all about living a luxurious lifestyle. So, you know, when you first encounter that play, you think, oh, isn't this funny? That would never happen. And I'm like, it happened. All these canonesses, these wealthy noble women, were living very luxurious lives. Now, they also did commit to, um, they were Christian, there's no doubt about that, and they committed to certain of the offices that they had to do. But they could travel, they had interaction with the world. Um, Roswitha had patrons who followed her writing. Um, they engaged with things, and, and yet they were protected. So this was both a refuge uh, from marriage, where they wouldn't have been able to do any of this, right? And a liberating place to be. This may not seem like that to us today. And <coughs> even though she was writing with these reforms in mind that she was pushing a deeper spiritual life and getting rid of devils and paganism, her writing still subverts the gender dynamics that we think of. Um, it emphasizes feminine strength. So whether she's writing in her poems, The Saints' Lives, or in the plays, that it is the women who are the tough ones, the women who are having their way and preserving their independence no matter what. So to us, you know, martyrdom may not be the ideal way of preserving your independence, but it is certainly one way. Um, also, when they discovered her works, when they were rediscovered, it upended what everybody had thought about the development of Western theater, right? So we all know, well, at most of us in this room, I'm assuming, theater people, that, you know, there was supposedly no theater after the fall of Rome, and the church banned it. But then because they didn't, they couldn't get pagan people who didn't speak Latin to understand the liturgy, they started acting bits of it out. So we have the Easter tropes that are supposedly the first one, a little call and response that the priest did with, you know, somebody else. And then that gradually grew. And then it got so big that it had to spill out into the church courtyard. And eventually the guilds took it over, and they all had their own specialty, and they did all the stories of the Bible. And that became popular 
um, really at the height of that was the 15th century. But here we have something that denies that. This play <coughs> exists in the 10th century. And it is exactly a miracle play. It is the very definition of a miracle play. Again, so if this is, we we're dealing with that, what are we missing, you know, through all these centuries? Um, even though she was very well known at the time that she was writing, when she died, no, her writings were lost and nobody really knew about her. Um, until 1493, when Conrad, and I'm terrible at my, at my Latin pronunciation, Celtes, or, right, he was a humanist, found them and published them. And uh, it was so, the place of women as scholars and academics and writers had been so degraded by that time, 500 years later, that they thought he was a fraud. That they could, no one could conceive of the fact that a woman had written all this, not just her plays, but, but the other writings. Um, and subsequent pieces were found that proved that she had, in fact, written them. Um, and she was kind of restored. But even then, if they knew about her in 1501, the republication of her work, in 2019, you know, she's a footnote maybe in a theater history textbook, or she may now be beginning to be more prominent. But again, it's not just about talking about um, her and her works as a, in isolation. So that's why I thank you for indulging me, but I just really, for me, all these connections, this is one of the things that made this evening so exciting, and why the work matters. You know, when we know about her and we look at her letters and we look at her communication, that there were abbeys all over the place, that she women having the same education. And and you know, further back. So so now you're gonna get to hear one of her this is the second play in her in the volume of her works, um, Dulcetus. And then I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about Helen Clark. But thanks, thanks for your patience and your <laughs> Also known as the Sibyl of the Rhine. <laughs> Sibyls were the oracles in ancient Greece, um, and she certainly earned that title. She was born about 100 years after Rosvita died. Um, she was also from a noble family. This was a thing with these abbeys, but she didn't get the same kind of education that Rosvita got. Um, her writing, her output was massive that uh, her collected works are contained in the Weisbotting Codex, which weighs more than 30 pounds, all of her works together. And she was a full nun, not a canoness. Um, she could speak and read basic Latin, but it apparently wasn't good enough for her publication, so she had secretaries that would polish it up and put it into formal Latin. She also was able to dictate some of her works. But, Interestingly, no matter the quality of her formal Latin, she actually invented her own language um, that was based on medieval Latin, and she used it, some people theorize that she used it uh, to strengthen the solidarity among her nuns or even for some mystical purposes. She began her convent life in much stricter circumstances than most Rita did. And we're not 100% sure when she entered the convent, um, but she was very sickly as a kid because she started having visions when she was three. She may have been an epileptic, these may have been um, migraines, no one really knows. Uh, so her parents gave her to the church as a tithe. And at some point, whether it was immediate or after she'd been there a while, she was enclosed in a cell with an anchorite named Jada. And anchorites were women who literally were walled in to a little hut or chamber that was attached to the church and there was a grill through which they could communicate and be fed, but they uh, vowed to never leave if they couldn't go outside. So it's very hard to figure this out because uh, Hildegard was her companion and was in the cell with her, but also in other places they say she worked in the gardens and she, so it may have been that she was able to come and go. Uh, but Jenna was also a visionary and people would come. The anchorites were not in solitude just because they were, you know, walled up in a little room. Uh, people came to them for prophecies, for their visions to be interpreted, for their knowledge, for any number of things. Um, she was pretty popular. 
Jaya. And when she died, um, the nuns, the comet, immediately elected Hildegard as their new abbess. Jada was the abbess. I don't know how that works if you're like walled up in a little cell, but you're the administrator of an entire abbey. Uh, so it seems like Hildegard probably had a lot of training in that. She was probably doing a lot to make that happen. And um, when she became the abbess, she was almost 40. And she had been having these visions since she was three, but she'd always kept it a secret. And she told Jada and uh, the monk Volmar, who was her tutor and also later her secretary, that five years after she became the abbess, she had a blinding vision that said, you need to write this stuff down. You need to speak. You need to get the word out. Um, and it would take her the rest of her life, from 40 till she died, um, to do three volumes of her visions. And then the first one took her 10 years because she went all the way back to her childhood. She apparently remembered all the visions that she had from age three and was able to describe them. And another thing, you know, we talk about connections. Did anybody see this bit about a medieval woman who was found, they were looking at her teeth because they were taking the plaque because they figured they could do dyes, and they found um, lapis lazuli in, in the plaque. Um, and there were all these questions about what it could be and all that, because illuminators in the medieval world, they used lapis lazuli to make the blue ink. But no one would believe that a woman could have been an illuminator, but one of uh, two of Hildegard's um, publications are massively and beautifully illuminated that she supervised. Now, if she was in a cloister with nuns and one monk, who do we think did that illumination, right? It's not that she did it herself, but she supervised it. So this just appears recently, you know, as, as technology gets better and people are using more tools to try to figure out what, how people actually live their lives. I believe that she was a 10th century woman as well, what they found that. Um, once she got clearance on her visions, she decided she was getting out of that abbey and going somewhere where she could be fully in charge. Um, and the abbot said, no, you can't. So she appealed to the archbishop, and he said, yes, you can. And the abbot still said, no, you can't. So she just conveniently fell into a paralysis, couldn't get out of her bed, couldn't be moved. Um, the abbot himself tried to pick her up and move her. So we see this connection with what we just saw with, with the, the sisters, right? Where they couldn't be moved, their clothes couldn't be, couldn't be removed. Um, so maybe uh, Hildegard had been reading some roast of that. Uh, and so that finally convinced him that she could go. And they picked a site in Rupertsburg that had been destroyed. It was this rundown place. And she was going because she wanted to have a, a closer spiritual life, less grandiose, less good stuff and luxury. Um, so they rebuilt that. And we think that the uh, piece that you're going to see to, right after this was uh, performed for the dedication of her own, very own, uh, abbey. In addition to writing about uh, your, all of her writing in the theater or, or poems, she also wrote a medical and scientific books because she had an enormous amount of experience using herbs for healing. And it was a very practical application. There's actually a website you can go and see, uh, the Healing Arts of Rosewitha, that uh, the connection between mind and body and spirit. And she discovered music therapy before you know it became a thing in the 20th century that she understood how that worked. Um, the thing about her books on healing are really significant because they're using the practices that women had used for centuries. But none of those other women had written them down. They couldn't write them in Latin. They may have written them down in some kind of form. But they didn't survive because they weren't written in Latin. So these, you know, I don't think we can say that Hildegard invented all of the uh, remedies that she has in her medical books. She also preached publicly, which as a full nun and not a canoness, was pretty amazing that she could go out into the world. And she had the chutzpah to preach to the clergy about corruption in the clergy. <laughs> and she preached to the laity about this as well. And over 400 of her letters survived, and she wrote to popes and emperors and kings and other abbesses and a whole range of people. And from these, you can tell she wasn't afraid to criticize anybody, even the emperor Frederick, um, because he had supported what, you know, was supposed to be anti-popes. 
her influence was great even in her own time because of this correspondence, because of these connections, um, and because of the way she lived her life. And so the Orto Virtutum, did I say that right? I'm assuming, right. Uh, I'm assuming that is it, uh, is considered the first morality play because mystery play, morality play, right? So we have both of them with the first miracle slash mystery play. Um, and those were considered real because they were doing Bible stories or they were doing saints' lives. Morality plays were allegorical. And so uh, Hildegard uses allegory um, in this play to tell her story of the triumph of good over evil. And some people think that because she made all the virtues female, that this was a signal um, that there's a feminist or proto-feminist message in there. And some people may say, well, that's just, you know, how she cast it. But when she was in a cloister with only nuns and and Volmer, right? And they, they had to play all the parts. So they are literally it's stipulated that the virtues are played by women. When this the uh, when it's done fully, it's usually completely sung and you can find it online versions and it usually takes about an hour because the singing, you know, goes on and on. So tonight you're going to see here, we go to here, um, the line spoken with a little taste of what the music would be like. Uh, she was also a, a pioneer in the way in which she used music. I, there's, there is so much written about both of these women that it would be a lifetime of study um, to learn it all, but I really encourage you to go find out more um, and spread the word. <laughs> Women did all this stuff long, long ago. <laughs>